Welcome back to the Social Work Race. Curtis here, and yes, I know I've always said it. I'm behind on podcasts. I actually have the content. I just haven't converted it. So let's get going before you slaughter me. So today I wanted to look at a very interesting topic called parental alienation. Oh, I've done it before and I'll do it again. Um, I find this topic really interesting. Why? Because I think the most challenging things to assess or deal with in social work is something that I'm kind of addicted to in the sense that I like to explore challenging things. Um, That's a funny side of me. I won't go into it now. But yeah, parental alienation um, is really about when two parents are not together, but the child is in some capacity being manipulated against the other parent. And the other parent who is most likely or possibly um, a good parent, but finds that the child doesn't want to be in their company for various reasons. And it is something that is actually illegal And it's something that the courts will sometimes ask us to explore or we may want to explore it um, in our own child and family assessments. Depends on what the issues are on hand, right? But what we're looking at is trying to ascertain if you can tell what are the signs of when a child is being alienated from another parent. So let me just give you kind of a a bit of context. So parents have split up and it's typically mum that has the child and uh, dad sees them maybe once a week or once every other week or something like that for a day or two. Um, But suddenly or at some point through the separation, the child is like, "Ah, I don't want to be with dad or I don't want to be with mum. More commonly where the child is with mum, so they usually don't want to see their dads for some reason. Why is that? Um, I'll put it on mute. So, so what happens is that sometimes we will have to go in and explore that. So I'm going to give you a load of tips, things that you need to look for in, um, in regard to trying to ascertain if one parent is trying to play off their child against the other, okay? So usually there's like a court order. Let's say it's uh, 50-50, 70-30, and suddenly mum is like not allowing the children to go to um, contact or spend time with dad over the weekend or whatever time that they're allowed and you have to kind of look at the reasons why the child doesn't want to um, be involved with the parent it's a very tricky thing to do so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a lot of tips and I want you to think about these things if you're dealing with it now as a parent or if you are a social worker, I mean, obviously this is for social workers so that we can do our assessments, right? See if you can do that work. And I'm gonna give you some tips. Here we go, let's get straight into it. Signs of, it's a long list, I'm not gonna be able to do it by memory. Um, So these are some of the signs and then I'll share a little bit of my experience with it as well, okay? The child actively avoids, resists or refuses a relationship with the non-preferred parent. And your job is to ascertain why, you know? or to ascertain if that's actually happening, right? Here we go. Um, The child and the non-preferred parent once had a positive relationship. Yeah, so you have to dig into their past with questions, okay? The child has unwavering support for the alienating parent. So maybe it's mum. They have overwhelming support for mum who they spend most of their time with and criticizes the other parent. Yeah, okay. The child expresses disapproval towards the targeted parent. Got to listen out for these things. You've got to really be on it because, okay, let let me go into it because you know me, I'll go off track. Okay. Uh, The child justifies their own hostile actions. Yeah. So you can get this through asking questions and just listening. All right. Um, the child adopts the opinions of the alienating parent as their own. This is a classic clue. Yeah, it's a classic clue. Okay, okay. Um, the child is impervious to feelings of guilt, so they feel totally justified. So that's an extension of the previous one. 
they feel that, well, actually, yeah, well, don't you feel bad about what you're saying about that? No? Okay, why not? That's for you to dig into. And, you, and this is the thing, don't think that because you don't get answers that you haven't got answers, okay? Sometimes the answers are in the question not being answered, not being answered properly. Um, the alienating parent makes the target parent appear dangerous or sick unstable the alienating parent shares the child custody case or child support details with the child oh come on so you you're going to ask questions about or, or try to listen out for what a child knows about the parent's relationship because in, in reality a child really shouldn't be exposed to the details it's it's out of their pay grade it's out of their age group it's inappropriate right so you have to be listening out for what the parent, one parent is saying to the child about what's going on, okay? The alienating parent exaggerates about the target parent's faults or lies to the child, okay? Conflates information, conflates harm, risk. That's a form or a part of parental alienation. The alienating parent uh, engages in harmful parenting practices. I'm going to leave that one out because you've you've got a that's a very broad topic in itself. Okay. The child takes on traits of the alienating parent, such as a lack of empathy and rigid thinking. And children can be reasonably rigid, although they're easily um, not rigid, narrow-minded, but rigid meaning that they don't want to change the way they think or feel. And you've got to explore that because sometimes that's what what is happening is, is that one parent is creating that monster of mindset for that child so you've got to look at that right the child may resist visits with the other parent but then enjoy their time when they are alone with mum uh, or in the case of mum or dad and away from the alienated parent it's a lot the child strongly resists any contact with the alienated parent and maintains resentment and opposition during their time with them. Yeah. And lastly, the child may not strongly resist any contact with the alienated parent, but may also run away or hide to avoid having a visit with them. Listen out for these signs, okay? Um, because when you're dealing with the parent that's doing the alienating, <clears throat> they will not admit to anything that you're suggesting. They will not do it. And that is that is a promise, okay? They will claim um, that the child's running away because the other parent is abusive or hostile. Um, but children don't do that naturally by themselves. When they're being abusive or uh, abused, um, they will typically give different behaviours. They won't necessarily hate the parent. T children um, don't easily hate their parents. Um, I want you to understand that. And that's something you need to look at. It's not natural for a child to want to run away unless they are being abused significantly. And if they don't uh, disclose any particular behaviors of abuse, meaning physical harm or serious and significant emotional harm. Um, if that's not taking place and a child can't identify in any way, and you know, it might vary as to what they can articulate uh, as per their age, then you have to say, well, why? Because it's not normal. Children don't do that unless there is a, a learning or developmental need. And that, then that could be like through autism, that might be their go-to behavior. But other than that, it's not normal, so why would that happen? And you have to dig deeper into that. But I can advise you on this. Um, doing this work with a family in terms of trying to ascertain if there is any alienation means that you're going to make at least one parent very uncomfortable, and that is most likely the case. If there is parental alienation, it is going to be met with a lot of resistance if you start to call out or identify things that aren't right. You're going to upset a parent if that's the case. Yes. And or, sadly, the child, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, you're going to be 
picking away at well, why why are you crying and you've never been hit why if the parent has never hurt you and you've never seen them hurt the other parent because children find it very difficult to lie so when you ask them direct questions you catch them off guard and they're going to answer the truth in many respects when you ask them these questions they're going to answer that in some ways the truth I have never been hurt, I've never been hit, I've never been abused, I've never seen abuse, but I don't like them because they're abusive. It doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. So you can pick away at the truth on this. Okay. Um, you've got to use your eyes and look at the behaviors that the child is displaying, or the mother, or the father. You've got to look at their behaviors and document their behaviors. Okay, and if you think that someone is not telling the truth, the one of the it's very difficult to write it down and say they're not telling the truth. You've got to say they're not telling the truth because when I asked certain questions, this question, this was their answer. Their answers changed. Their answers grew in conflictory language. Um, uh, when I pressed the mum on or dad on the issue of X, they they became. Um, difficult and they didn't want to answer the question um, they they wanted to exit the assessment stuff like that is clues and you can document that so to evidence you have to ask questions and then document the responses so it's always good to be prepared have 10 15 questions prepared before you get to the family um, and look at the obviously look at the referral and dig into areas of abuse and harm or, or alleged abuse and harm um, and then pick away it and say well this doesn't add up what do you mean I've had a child cry and shake at the name of at the sound of their parents name and they've never seen abuse and they've never been hurt and I'm like that doesn't make sense you've got to document that and then when it goes to court somebody's going to be angry with you you better believe that and that is um that is, that is what's going to happen. Finally, I just want to say you've got to put in your assessments quotes and answers. So quote as much as you can things that are relevant to, to determining the outcome. Johnny said X. Mary said this. When I asked Mary, has so-and-so ever hit you? Mary said yes, but or no, I have never been physically harmed. Okay, when was the last time so-and-so hit you or what did mum say to you when x happened did you see blood did you see anyone being beaten up and when did you see that and then you are oh, answer the question mostly in their voice to say this is what they said and then you analyze it at the end but it's a it, it, i was watching um, um a lawyer talk about this topic okay and this is a trap that sometimes professionals fall into a lawyer was talking about this and said that in 50% of the cases that he has worked and he's had like about 30, 40 years in the, in the game, he said half of them involve parental alienation. So when some cases come to social services and parents are, one parent is screaming about the abuse of another, it may be true at least half the time. So we have to understand that we cannot believe anybody until we've done the work to explore. It doesn't matter how much tears you see, how much shaking and how much emotion. We only understand more about the truth when we ask the questions and dig into it and get the answers and then analyze. And my advice to you is to believe no one until you've done that. It doesn't matter if they've been to the police 50 times or, or if other professionals, and this is a mistake that some professionals make, is that they believe one of the parents because they're very convincing. It's a dangerous move. And I had a conversation with a safeguarder need in a school recently, and they said, we will not believe one side of the story. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes they do. And I think there's a, a, a psychology behind that, which is something I've mentioned before, and I'll go into it again another day, where you can um, you find a commonality, an association, probably because you've been through it yourself or because you have that natural disposition. And so social workers have to learn how to regulate and monitor their own biases whilst on the job. And I've had a few. And it means 
to, to get through that, you have to have discussions with your colleagues or your manager to supervise you through that experience because there's always going to be a, tr- a case that triggers or reminds us of our own. So um, don't believe anything that anyone says until you've done your analysis. Yeah. All right. So that's my tip on parental alienation. And that helps us also to just analyze true for to analyze the risk in general by asking more questions. Hopefully that helps. Take care of yourself.